This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. This online commercial real estate program is designed to take you from beginner to pro commercial real estate investor with access to all of my courses, our online community, and monthly group coaching calls. Learn how to confidently buy your first commercial property today at www.crelaunchpro.com. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast, live from the Cobble Group Studios here in Nashville, Tennessee, for another episode of Office Hours. You've got questions about commercial real estate, and that is exactly what this half hour every Tuesday morning at 8.30 a.m. Central Standard Time is for. Jump in the live chat, ask your questions, and uh, hopefully I'll get you some good answers. You get what you pay for, I guess. Uh, In the office hours, we also do a giveaway. We started that last week. I might just keep doing that every week uh, because I am having some fun with that, and I know you all are as well. So uh, if you want to join the giveaway, all you have to do is join live and leave a comment uh, in the live chat or ask a question about commercial real estate, and you'll get entered to win. Uh, The prizes include a one-on-one coaching session with me, uh, the Beginner's Guide to Commercial Real Estate Investing course, Tyler AI, which is a pretty interesting thing I'm testing out right now. Uh, an underwriting spreadsheet of your choice, one month of group coaching, a hard copy of my book, Open for Business, or a CRE Discord membership. Those are all chosen at random, and uh, we'll see kind of where we go. Dave is grateful, jumping in with Rocker Horns. Love it, Dave. Good to see you, man. Uh, so let's uh, let's give you a little bit of an update over the past week. Uh, we filmed one of our longest YouTube videos uh, ever uh, this past week, which is a lot of fun. It was an intense deep dive video. Wanted it to be somewhat of a, you know, master course, crash course on commercial real estate investing for beginners. So uh, I think it'll be titled something like literally everything you need to know to buy your first commercial property. It's probably going to be a 25 to 30 minute long video, uh, very in depth. Um, So looking forward to that. We've also got a video that's going semi viral this week. The video that we put together on the Russell Hotel here in Nashville. Uh, which is titled Inside Nashville's Most Profitable Airbnb Hotel uh, or Boutique Hotel. I forget which one it is. Uh, Either way, uh, we updated the thumbnail a couple of times. It's funny how YouTube works. Sometimes you just have to play around with things for a little bit and figure out what's going to work. We updated the the thumbnail two or three times, and on the final time, it just started taking off. So in the last 48 hours, I think it's gotten over 2,000 views which is pretty good. I mean, you know, most of my videos uh, get somewhere between, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 views in the first week. And that one's at a little over 3,000. So doing pretty well. It's a fun video. Really enjoyed making that one. James McCarthy is saying, sup, what's up, James? Good to good to see you, man. Thanks for jumping in. Um, I'm also, you know, this is kind of a teaser here. So don't tell anybody because y'all are by far the first to hear about it. But I am working with Logan Freeman, uh, on a commercial real estate brokerage mastermind. We have both been looking at the coaching offerings for commercial real estate brokers. You know, we have a lot of, of followers on both of our you know, social platforms that are commercial real estate brokers looking to get into investment or just looking to grow their brokerage business. And you know, when Logan and I first got started, and honestly, even still today, there aren't great resources out there for learning how to become a commercial real estate broker, growing your business there, and then transitioning it and becoming an investor. So we're going to start a mastermind with some limited seating and uh, test it out this year. We're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Jorge is saying, good morning, Tyler, wishing you a low stress and successful day. Jorge, I appreciate that, man. I can always use a low stress and successful day. Hope you have the same. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about that. I mean, we I've been talking about doing a mastermind for a little bit, and I know some of y'all that are not interested in commercial real estate brokerage are probably thinking, well, damn, I wish he would do that for investing. And at some point we will. I'm taking baby steps. It's a lot of work um, to put that stuff together. And y'all know I do not want to deliver anything to you that is not 110% uh, perfectly well put together and ready to roll. And uh, Logan and I have that program together for the brokerage side. So it'll come for the investing next. Uh, we're also working on some new YouTube sets. You know, that's kind of just, uh, you know, again, a little behind the scenes thing that we're, we're working on here. But y'all can see, you know, this is my typical live stream set, right? This is probably always going to be 
Uh, not always. We may change it up at some point. But this is always going to be, for today, my live stream set. I'm not going to move it into any of the other rooms I've got, but I do have one, two. I've got two other rooms uh, that we haven't done anything with. And so we're going to turn those into a couple more sets and um, set them up for, you know, filming during, you know, regular videos or maybe even some interviews, something like that. So it's kind of nice. We're building out a full, you know, multi room YouTube studio here in Nashville. You know, as y'all may know, uh, a few, I guess a few weeks ago, kind of told you that, that YouTube is becoming. Uh, I mean, that in investments is 100% my full-time job now, right? So I'm probably spending, you know, 10 hours a week, give or take on YouTube stuff. And then the other, you know, 30 to 50 is spent on the investment side of things. So uh, it's, it's fun. I'm really, really enjoying what I'm getting to do today. Um, we are also looking at hiring an investor relations uh, person for the company. Uh, got a got a guy in mind that I'm talking to right now. He's a Vanderbilt Owen MBA school graduate, and uh, you know excited to see where that can go. That's one thing that we have never had at the company that I think would be a game changer for us as we are growing what we've been doing. We typically raise between one million and four million dollars in equity for our investments uh, in a five hundred six B syndication. So anybody can invest with us. I just have to have a pre existing relationship with them. The problem is I'm more focused on the deal acquisition and execution side. And so whenever I am going through a capital raise, I end up having to basically switch what I've been doing and go focus on raising capital, which distracts me from the thing that I'm really good at and honestly that I'm passionate about and love. So having somebody that's full-time uh, on the team whose role is to go out there and talk to all of our investors, network, build up that list of investors – Go and find you know more people to invest with us, or just confirm the amounts, right? Because sometimes you'll have you know some people say, "Oh, I'll give you five hundred thousand dollars," but then you talk to them a week later and something's happened, and really it's a hundred thousand. So you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully bringing him on will help us really dial in um, the program there. Because I'm looking at, at doing another couple of capital raises this year. Uh, and as always, we're always looking to add solid commercial real estate brokers to the team. I was reviewing Q1 of this year, which, you know, if you're listening at, at another time, it's 2024. And I gave over 143 leads to my brokerage team. Uh, most of that comes through YouTube and the podcast, but we also have some that come through Instagram, my personal network, et cetera, et cetera. And that means that there is a lot of business that needs to be getting done. So if you're an outstanding broker, you've been in the business for three to five years or more, and you're looking to make a switch and you want some uh, you know, good leads and some aggressive compensation splits, uh, reach out. We'd love to talk to you. Don't forget, we are also doing a giveaway today. If you're just joining us now, we've got so many more people that have jumped in since we first kicked this off. All you have to do to join the giveaway is to comment uh, in the live chat or ask a question about commercial real estate. Let's get to Darius's question first. Do you have, do you use a, an LLC for investments or personal credit? Um, well, Darius, those are two different things. Um, so yes, I do use an LLC for all of our investments, uh, and personal credit. Like, do you mean credit score or do you mean like a line of credit? Um, you know, yes, I have to use my personal credit score. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the greatest. I mean, I, I definitely have a below 700 credit score because I keep every time we go and we get a loan for a commercial property, they run my credit. And so the amount of inquiries that I have on my credit always keeps it down, uh, which is so frustrating. If anybody knows what to do about that, let me know. Uh, but that's that's kind of where we are with that. Uh, as far as like a personal line of credit, no, I have not done a personal line of credit. I could do one on my house. I've got plenty of equity in that. I've got plenty of equity in some of my other properties, but I tend to, I like to keep things siloed and let them figure themselves out. So uh, I, I'm a big fan of using an LLC for, for investments. We're starting to explore using some trusts as well. I mean, there's pros and cons to each. Uh, we're also doing a trust in an LLC, right? Um, there's, you know, that's one way to, to doubly protect yourself, I guess is the way to do it. Let's see. James is saying the question is, I want to buy one or two acres and build a few houses there. So, what do you think about that? Because uh, I've been looking to, uh, 
been looking at buying acres, and it seems like cheaper, I guess, than buying houses, right? I mean, James, yeah, absolutely. Look, new construction homes are great as long as you know what you're doing. The biggest thing is, you know, if you um, are not monitoring your general contractor, it can get out of hand very quickly. So just make sure that you, you know, know what you're doing or you bring somebody in that does know what they're doing and uh, just go through the steps right. I mean, I, I think that building anything is going to be a much better option for, you know, gaining equity than buying, right? Because if you're building, you're going to build it and you're going to inherently have some equity in there that you're building up. Whereas if you're buying it, you're probably buying it for retail, uh, unless you're like really buying something cheap that needs a lot of work. So, you know, something to keep in mind. Max is saying, I've just started working as an investment analyst. They've asked me to come up with five to 10 ideas of which real estate niche to focus on and why. How would you go about tackling a task like this? Well, Max, as a real estate analyst, you are a data guy, right? So sit down and look at the data, review the data, see what trends are causing people to do certain things and start thinking through what are the potential, like what's the potential fallout from that, right? I mean, let's talk about it. You know, here, just the first thing that comes to mind, there's a lot of people moving to the Southeast. Well, nobody can keep up with the amount of homes that need to be built. So are there trends in, you know, uh, apartments, right? Building more apartment units. Are there trends in building more condo units? Are there trends in building more single family homes, townhomes, uh, self-storage, right? Because they're going to have to, you know, put all their stuff somewhere if they don't have enough place, you know, enough space to live. Um, they'll also, you know, moving is big, right? So maybe, you know, buy some industrial that has moving companies in it or some massive storage. You know, there's all sorts of things that you could kind of, you know, dive into around that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're an analyst, I would just use your skills and, and start doing the research and figuring out, you know, what's going on in the real estate market that, you know, could, could be of interest, right? Like, Back in 2020, you know, nobody could open up a restaurant with people inside of it. So ghost kitchens were a huge thing back then. You know, it's it's tough to really predict what the next trend is going to be. But it's very easy to see what the data is telling you today. And then just really extrapolate as to where that could go. Jake is saying, would love to hear what you think on this. What's your take on the advice of niche down and pick one thing to be super focused on versus being good and pursuing a bunch of different deals, ideas, and niches? Yeah, Jake. So my, my opinion on this um, really hasn't changed over the years. I think that when you're first starting out, it is better to niche down and do one thing, right? Because it's, it's you, you got to learn the rules of the game. You've got to learn, like if you learn how to lease office space or how to buy, you know, single tenant net lease deals, 80% of that knowledge will transfer into any other type of commercial real estate. So when you're first starting out, you already have enough to learn, even if you're just picking one asset class, that like that's a steep learning curve. So I would just focus on knocking that out of the park, getting to know it as well as possible, and then you can branch out from there. Right? So uh, it, it makes a big difference in at least building the foundation, right? If you build the right foundation, you can build anything that you want on top of it. If you build a poor foundation because you were focused on so many different things, whatever you build on top of that is going to topple. So I, I'm a big fan of being diversified and focusing on a lot of different things, right? I mean, you look at me today. We're doing a boutique hotel. I've done a food hall. I own some office buildings. I own some retail buildings. I own some industrial buildings. I mean, we're building a single family custom home. I've built townhomes. We've done a little bit of everything. But when I first started out, I was not doing any of that, right? I was just focused on one thing, becoming a great leasing agent. So I think that uh, over time, you will be able to kind of diversify into whatever you want really from there. The CRA group is saying, hey, from NODAC. Nice. North Dakota. What's going on, CRA group? Jorge, Tyler, I'm working with a great mentor in his investment company. Right now, I'm making cold calls and prospecting deals for them. I will be trained to do other things. Do I need to get a broker's, I'm assuming broker's license? Um, so, Jorge, if, uh, if you're working in-house for a group, you don't necessarily have to have a broker's license. 
Uh, once you start doing deals third party for other people, that is when you do need to get a broker's license. So if you are leasing buildings that your company owns, or you are helping your company buy buildings, you don't need a broker's license. Um, and and for those you know layman terms, real estate license, right? Just a general you know real estate license. Uh, if you do decide to start doing it for third party individuals, you will have to get a, a real estate license. I don't think it's a bad thing to get licensed anyway, right? It's it's just a nice you know thing to have. Um, unfortunately, in commercial real estate, you don't learn anything in the training for whatever reason, they don't actually differentiate between a residential and a commercial real estate license. They absolutely should. So 99.9% of what you will learn going through that class is residential. But again, doesn't hurt to have all of that. Eric saying, I see lots of people mention not renting automotive tenants or avoiding purchasing properties with those tenants. What's the main concern? Environmental? And wouldn't that be alleviated through due diligence? Who, Eric, it's going to depend largely on what kind of property it is, right? Like if it's a junkyard, then yes, there will be some environmental concerns. There are some properties that I've looked at here in East Nashville that we decided not to pursue because of that. And yes, it could be alleviated through due diligence, but a lot of times sellers have very unrealistic expectations of what is actually going on in their property. They think, oh, well, I've owned it for 30 years and it's been fine. Uh, not realizing that all of the oil and chemicals that have been falling out of those vehicles into the soil for 30 years has actually caused a massive issue at the property that you will likely have to spend tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, or even millions of dollars to remediate. So that's the that's the biggest issue as to why people will avoid purchasing those assets. I mean, look, if it's if it's like an auto sales lot, who cares? That's fine. Um, if it's a mechanic shop, again, it's the environmental issues. So not all of those are a big deal, right? I mean, just have a phase one done. If the phase one, you know, a phase one costs like fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars, right? It's it's not a big deal. If it's a good enough project uh, and it's worth working on, then go for it. If it recommends a phase two, then you start having discussions with the seller about how they need to be paying for all of that. Unless uh, I don't get too bought into the property, unless it's just such a screaming deal that you're willing to pay for it. I've only paid for one phase two in my entire career. It was for Peerless Mill. And that's because it's a one and a half million square foot site that we bought for $5.6 million. Like it was absolutely worth it for me to go through that pain and figure it out. Um, so, you know, it's... Just don't get, don't fall in love with the properties because you know it's the, those oil spills can they get really expensive. Um, the biggest issue is like typically on these you know auto lots, people are not disposing of the oil and the chemicals properly, and if they're doing that right, like I mean if you've got a big national brand that's a tenant, they're probably doing it right, right? Uh, but it's usually these local guys that are just dumping it in the creek in the back, and you know that causes all sorts of issues. <laughs> Nick is saying, thinking about starting an RV storage space is my first commercial real estate property. Is this market too saturated in the Austin area? Should I focus elsewhere? Uh, Nick, as, as far as is the market too saturated in Austin, I have no clue. I'm in Nashville, uh, so I haven't been studying the RV storage space in Austin uh, here recently. Uh, what I will say is just go out there and study the market. See what the occupancy rates are for lots in your area. And that will give you an idea as to whether or not it is saturated. Uh, if they're all at over 90% occupancy, probably not saturated. If you're seeing a lot that are sitting at like 50, 60, 70% occupancy, then yeah, it's probably oversaturated. You might want to look elsewhere. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that RV lots don't necessarily have to be near major cities to be very successful. I've got buddies that will buy them you know, in pretty much anywhere along major highway routes that are near you know, interesting attractions. So for example, East Tennessee, pretty much anywhere in East Tennessee would make sense for an RV park because you've got the the Smoky Mountains, right? So there's a lot of potential destinations for people to go to and, you know, you could make it work. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I would do. Um, you could also look at it as RV and boat storage. You could consider it just industrial outdoor storage that happens to accommodate RVs and boats and things like that. That way, you're not just specifically going for RVs. You could also open it up to a wide variety of potential users. 
Noah's saying, uh, about to graduate and be an associate broker for a boutique brokerage in College Station, Texas, specializing in multifamily and student housing. Any recommendations to start my career on the right foot? Noah, congrats. Um, College Station is awesome. I've got a sister at A&M. So shout out uh, there. As far as starting your career off on the right foot, this goes for any commercial real estate broker. Spend all of the time in the world when you're first getting started, getting out there and meeting everyone in your market and buying them coffee, buying them lunch. It doesn't matter if it's another commercial real estate broker. doesn't matter if it's a banker. doesn't matter if it's an attorney. doesn't matter if it's a buyer, whatever. Go meet everyone and have conversations with them. Ask their thoughts on the market. What are they going for? What do they see moving in the market? Things like that. Just ask all of the initial market research questions when you're first going through that just to get a basis uh, for what's going on in the market, right? It'll help you really understand what's going on. Plus, when you're sitting across the table from somebody negotiating a deal, it helps you so much to have a pre-existing relationship with that person. It's so easy to be an ass to somebody that you have never met before that has just sent you an email right? It's a lot more difficult to do that when the person likes you and you've had coffee together, right? Yeah, especially if you bought the coffee. So a couple of pieces of advice there, Noah. Hope that helps, man. Frank, good morning. In times of joint or, or in terms of joint ventures, are there platforms or networks that you might suggest that connects those who might be looking to partner for a project? Uh, Frank, not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, there's there's not a lot of those opportunities out there uh, for for multiple reasons. Um, but I mean, the the best way to go find partners is to network, spend time within uh, you know your local real estate investor meetups, uh, go out there and just meet people. Right, that's that's the way that I've done it. Some of my earliest partners were people who you know, as a commercial real estate broker, I helped them do their deals. Um, and then throughout the years, it's just people that I've met at mastermind events, people that I've met at networking events. I mean, people that I've just done business with in the past. And that's the best way to do it. You don't want to just like randomly get paired up with somebody on the internet and, you know, because you all both want to do a deal. People do not take into account the fact that getting into business with somebody is a marriage. It is just as intense as a marriage. You're going to be with them for two to five years working almost every day. And that means that you're really going to be around each other as much as you will your significant others. You need to know, like, and trust this person as much as you know, like, and trust your spouse or your best friend. Um, because, you know, if you get into a situation, money makes people weird, right? I've, I've talked about that before. I had a partner steal a million dollars from me. There is... You know, people just get weird when money gets involved. And, you know, it's it's better to try and know the people as best as you can. And I knew that guy for a while before he did that. So even sometimes then you can't protect yourself. Let's see. Um, all right, we got even more people in the live chat now. Gosh, over 40. Um, if y'all are just now joining us, we are doing a giveaway today. You can win, you know, group coaching calls, one-on-one -on -one coaching call, a hard copy of my book. Uh, so many different things. Uh, my course, Commercial Real Estate Investing for Beginners. If you uh, want to join in, just drop a comment in the live chat or ask a question, and you'll be automatically entered to win. We'll do the drawing at the end of this video. Let's see. Jacob sent a DM. Cool. Thanks, Jacob. John Morgan. John, what's going on, dude? Super KCD is the greatest addition to Nashville in the last five years. Okay, so he's talking about Suiza at... The Wash. If you guys have not been to The Wash, uh, you've got to go check out Suiza. They have a super quesadilla. It is one of the greatest things ever. I'm gonna, John. I'm gonna tell Chad, uh, the owner of of Suiza, that you jumped in the live chat to say that today. He's gonna love that. Uh, and yes, it's it's addicting. I mean, it is one of the is the best quesadilla hands down I've ever had. I'm not a big quesadilla guy, but damn, they just nail it. Let's see. Jesse is saying bought a four unit in Salt Lake City on VA loan, 2.8%. Damn, 2.8% interest. Keep that. Uh, great rate, but don't want to don't want that to hold me back uh, back from going larger. Market is tight and expensive. Curious how common seller financing is and how to navigate that. Um, how is Nashville then? I have family out in Tennessee. Jesse. Um, 
here's here's the thing. That is such an incredible opportunity. You may never get a 2.8% interest rate ever again. So if you can keep that and just cash flow it and just hold it for a while, I would 100% do that. Unless, and you'll have to run a cost-benefit analysis on this, the amount of equity that you would gain from selling that and 1031 exchanging into another property is at least like twice the cash on cash returns that you're getting today. And that's going to be tough to do considering where interest rates are. Because, I mean, you've got an incredible loan. Um, seller financing is, of course, feasible in commercial real estate. It's very tough to come across, though. And you have to really work it on your own. Most commercial real estate brokers are not willing to work with buyers that have to have seller financing. I mean, for obvious reasons, right? Like they want to know that the buyers they're working with have the cash to close. So whenever I'm working on seller financing deals, I'm typically the one going out and sourcing those myself. And it's a needle in a haystack, but when you find them, they're pretty damn good. So if you can keep that and go and expand your portfolio and think larger from there, I would do it. How's Nashville? And Nashville's great, man. It's it's tough to beat Nashville. It's, I mean, look, I've been here my whole life. It's you know I've I've been very fortunate to travel the United States, been to many many different cities, and there's just nothing like it. Um, I I love it here. So and it's been it's been wild. You know I haven't left, but it has. I've got a completely different city than what I grew up in because of how much it has just grown over the past few years. Vicken is jumping in saying, hey, hey, what's going on, Vicken? Good to see you. Orpheus, hey, boss, thinking of following my mentor to another company, but nervous to make the shift to a position that seems like a step back just for their needs. Property manager to lease admin. Well, Orpheus, there's a couple of things um, that I would, uh, you know, really, I guess, ask is, one, will the lease admin, will that teach you something that you like a skill that you do not currently have that could greatly benefit you in the future. It could. I just don't know how, you know, if, if you've already done lease admin and property, at least admin and property manager is, is above that. Uh, if the pay is equal, it seems like less responsibility, right? So, I mean, all things being equal, if the pay is the same, I would rather take a step back and <laughs> relax for a little bit. It'll give you some opportunities to focus on some other things, build some other skills, and then move on. Also, what is the long-term play here, right? Is your mentor saying, hey, do this for a year and then we'll move you into X? Or are they just saying, hey, follow me. This is the role. Um, also, keep in mind that like you can have a mentor at another company. Uh, you don't have to follow them to keep them as your mentor. Now, it's a lot easier to have a mentor within your company because you'll see them in the office every day. So you will have to be proactive about getting together with them. But don't think that you're just going to lose your mentor if you don't go with them to the other um, to the other company. And at the same time, too, you know they should have your best interests in mind no matter what, right? So if if it is actually better for you to stay, they should admit that and they should say it. Uh, that's that's what a good mentor would do. Max is saying waiting waiting for an updated day in the life of Tyler Cobble. Uh, that would be funny. I haven't done. Gosh, I haven't done one of those in well over a year. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing that. It'd be fun. It would be I, the funny thing is, like, I think it would be really boring. <laughs> it's uh, it's honestly a lot of like me sitting down doing research, looking at YouTube stats, and trying to figure out like, hey, what do we need to do next? Then it's me like editing some of these things and posting them uh, for the podcast. Um, but that being said, there are some really interesting things that I get to do on a weekly basis uh, that could be a lot of fun. So. Maybe we'll uh, we'll have to throw that one on the back on the board and and see where we can take it, Max. Uh, let's see, Blarissa GV. I hope I said that right. Hi, Tyler. What do you think about ground leases from the tenant's perspective? Have you ever underwritten commercial developments on leased land? So, from the tenant's perspective, are you le if you're leasing the ground and you're having to build everything? Hell no. I'm gonna run. That depends. Um, I mean, it's it's tough to make a blanket statement like that because for some tenants, it makes all the sense in the world, especially if you're getting like a 99-year ground lease. But the problem is like the amount of money that you're going to have to spend to build that building, you might as well like buy a piece of land. The only time that I would consider that is if you're looking at a piece of property that's like Maine and Maine, where there's no chance you could ever buy a commercial property like that. And a ground lease is the best way for you to get into that location. 
right? There's a reason it's so common in New York City, right, where there's just not a whole lot of land. Uh, whereas in you know Nashville, ground leases just aren't that common because you can go a couple blocks away and buy a piece of property. Um, so I think that, I mean, yes, we have underwritten commercial developments on leased land. The problem is banks don't typically like it unless you've got a, like a 99-year ground lease. Uh, there's still going to be a lot of stipulations that go into that. So it's really tough. And I'm sorry, guys, that is the last question that we can do today. I have got to do this drawing for the picker wheel. So let me pull this up real quick and start inputting everybody's names into it. And we'll uh, get this one rolling. All right, Dave, we got you in there. James McCarthy, you're in there. Jorge, got you in. Uh, Darius... Let's see, we've already got James. You know, one of these days, I'm telling you, I'm going to have like some sort of, I'm either going to have an assistant sit in here with me to knock these out for me so that I don't have to do it, or um, there will be some sort of, you know, uh, I guess a piece of software. I think, I think uh, Pat from um, Smart Passive Income is working on something right now. I've been listening to a couple of podcast episodes of his where he's been doing that. So we'll we'll see. Maybe uh, maybe he'll be releasing that here pretty soon, and I'll get to use it for this. All right. We're like halfway there. Stick with me. All right, Jesse, Vicken, Orpheus. All right, Cole. Now we got a bunch of people jumping in here at the last minute. <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, let's see. Hey, Meg, good to see you in here again. All right, let's see what we got. I'll share the screen right now. Those are all the names. All right, let's figure out first what the prize is. Like I said, we got a one-on-one -on -one coaching session, the course, AI, underwriting spreadsheet of your choice, group coaching. Looks like one month of group coaching. All right, cool. So that's uh, two group coaching calls. We've got about 30 people in my group coaching sessions right now, and those are always fun. They're typically 30 to 60 minutes long. Let's see who the winner is. Dave is grateful. Dave, I think you jumped in earlier in the conversation. Uh, feel free to drop me a DM on Instagram because you came in from Instagram. Uh, and I will get you hooked up with one month of group coaching here with me at CRE Launch Pro. Thank you all for joining me on another episode of Office Hours. I will see you all next week. This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. This online commercial real estate program is designed to take you from beginner to pro commercial real estate investor with access to all of my courses, our online community, and monthly group coaching calls. Learn how to confidently buy your first commercial property today at www.crelaunchpro.com.